Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful day here in uh, Williams College, enjoying the stunning Berkshire weather. It's great to welcome so many of you back. I know I'm, I had the opportunity to meet some of you uh, a few weeks ago when you first came to campus. I'm Maud Mandel. I'm the uh, president here at Williams College, and I'm here with my colleague, Dean Marlene Sandstrom, the dean of the college. Uh, and we are both, I think, very um, pleased and excited to, to have you back here on campus and to have an opportunity to chat with you um, a little bit uh, this morning. Um, the format today is going to be um, pretty straightforward. I'm going to just make a couple of remarks uh, to kick us off, and then uh, Marlene will say a few things, and then we'd really like to open up the uh, floor to questions from you since um, uh, we, we enjoy sem the seminar style over the lecture style and would like to know what's on your minds uh, as a way to, to keep the conversation relevant to the things you're curious about and interested in uh, about Williams. Um, but maybe before that, just a, a few words of, of setting the stage and introductions. So um, as some of you know, I, I like to say that I'm in my sophomore year at Williams. I got here a year ago uh, and, uh, and have spent um, now the little bit of the second year here, um, deepening my connections to um, to the place, but after having spent a, a swirling first year of learning it very well. How many of you uh, in the room are parents of first year students? Most of you, okay, wonderful. Well, uh, it's great to have you back. I know, I know what that's like. Actually, Marlene and I both have, uh, Marlene has a first year in college. I have a sophomore. I was just at family weekend at, at my son's uh, institution and uh, Marlene similarly. So we are, uh, we're right in it with you, very empathetic uh, to the experience of being a parent and what it's like to sit in that audience and look up at the folks up here and say so, how exactly are you taking care of my of my youngster, and uh, and uh, and what are the resources, and um, is everything as it should be? So I hope we can give you some some uh, words about that today, and and tell you a little bit about um, how we see it from our perspective uh, here on the campus. Um, I thought uh, I would just say, uh, as I sit in my sophomore year, just a couple of observations from the year or so that I've been on campus about what is so special about this school, and then talk to you just a little bit about some of the things that are going on right now um, from the vantage point of um, the president's office. Um, the number one observation I've had about Williams since arriving uh, is really been focused on the people. Um, and it is uh, this is a community made up of um, truly tremendous people. The faculty uh, who work here and who, who have really committed their professional lives to both educating undergraduates, which is its own very special form of uh, professional engagement by f folks who um, have committed the other part of their lives to um, research and moving uh, knowledge forward um, in the pursuits of uh, broadening what we know about uh, the world around us. Um, so the faculty here are um, a notably committed, uh, engaged, um, and um, uh, powerful group of individuals. Uh, and thanks to the wonderful student-faculty ratio here, one of the things that's really special about this place is it brings the other people who are amazing here together with those faculty, which is uh, the students. And um, this is always a good point in this uh, set of remarks to just thank you uh, for raising such wonderful students. Because one of my experiences being president here has been the just tremendous opportunity to get to know uh, a little bit about the folks who make their way here from so many corners of the globe uh, to spend four years with us on this campus. And a hardworking, um, committed, often quite funny, whimsical group of students. Uh, last night I had the pleasure, my family and I went to the Frosh Review. Have any of you been to the Frosh Review yet? Okay, so a couple of you were there. So you know what I mean. <laughs> They're funny. Um, I, I encourage uh, others of you to go tonight. Um, I had fun being lightly mocked uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation, um, and, uh, and I'm sure you will enjoy that too. <laughs> but uh, but um, they, are, they are really uh, a fantastic group of students, and here on the campus with the, the faculty I mentioned, also incredibly dedicated professional staff, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful cocktail of human ingenuity and engagement that allows um, pretty magical things to happen. Uh, I've had the pleasure this year, one of the things that's been distinct of my, about my sophomore year from my first year, uh, is that I've been actually uh, able to teach a class this year. So I've been teaching a tutorial myself, 
with six uh, very, um, well, slightly intimidated, but initially, but very uh, hardworking students. Um, and that has been a great experience for me because I get to meet students all the time, but to be able to do it in this sustained, in the classroom way uh, that connects to the core mission of the institution has been um, a great way for me to see uh, what the life of a Williams student is like um, and to do it through the format of the tutorial. And I, I should note, as a side note for those of you who have students here who have not yet to take a tutorial. I really do encourage you to encourage them to take advantage of this very Williams-esque mode of learning, which allows um, students to engage very, very deeply with a faculty person, but also with another student uh, in ways that um, profoundly forward their writing skills, their ability to express themselves orally, um, and to think on their feet. And it's, uh, I had never myself either taken or taught a tutorial before, which is really why, one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Um, and it has, it has really been a valuable experience for me. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, seeing it through the eyes of students now uh, also for them. Um, so what I'd like to do with the rest of my time with you today is tell you a little bit about what's going on on campus um, from, from my office and from my eyes and what we're trying to accomplish here uh, over the next stretch of time that will, I think, have a big impact on your students and subsequent students um, in the years to come. And that is that uh, we have launched a um, strategic planning process here on campus, which is really seeking to answer the, the question, um, what can Williams do now at this point in its history uh, in, and its future to think about um, how to build on its tremendous legacy in undergraduate education and to position uh, students for success um, and the ability to attain their highest aspirations while they're here uh, in the years to come. And this comes from a deep belief on my part that institutions of higher education can never rest on their laurels, that, that we've always, because the world around us changes, we always have to be thinking deeply about um, uh, how our curriculum needs to change, how our uh, offerings need to grow and expand, and what we can do even better than uh, we've done before. Um, and it's, it's particularly important because um, institutions like Williams are in the business of educating students who are going to go out and make a difference in the world. That is uh, the, 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 the incredibly talented students that we bring to this campus um, are likely going to go on to be leaders in the various sectors they join, whether it's higher education themselves or research uh, or um, medicine or law uh, or business. Wherever they go, um, they are very likely uh, going to, um, to, to be people who are leading the charge in those, uh, in those institutions. Um, moreover, they're going into a world fastly accelerating, full of its own myriad challenges, and providing them with the supple skills uh, and the ability to be lifelong learners going forward is the thing that liberal arts has always committed itself to, um, but, uh, but must continually also itself, higher education, be a learning institution to understand and think about how it has to change in light of the changing world. And so we're really looking at all aspects of the college from the student um, learning experience experience to think about curriculum, to think about uh, um, skill sets, how we use our time, um, how we teach our competencies. This has included things like thinking about experiential learning, more deeply to thinking about summers and winter study, uh, to think about the ways we teach writing and data analysis, uh, and how we can um, be sure that our students are best positioned in all of those areas. But we're also doing a lot of thinking about learning outside the classroom, and this is something that I am um, really interested in myself because when I think about a place like Williams, what I think one of the things it does so beautifully is it is a residential college. It is a place where the learning is happening inside and outside the classroom every single day. And we think a lot in our institutions of higher education about what we do inside the classroom. Um, but I want us to give as equal attention to what are our learning goals outside the classroom. Is it, um, whether it's in talking across difference or leadership skills uh, or self-care how, what are our goals in this area and how are we using um, our, our staff and our institutional structures and the students themselves to move forward in those goals. Um, 
and how can we support faculty and staff developments in such ways that we continue to attract the very best to our campuses, um, to our campus, and, and that we uh, support them so that they can continue to do what they so do so well with students, um, offering research opportunities uh, on their, their own cutting edge research to let students have a deep understanding of what it takes to be an expert in something, to work with uh, uh, a faculty member to continue to think about um, broadening knowledge as we know it. Uh, and that's really something that Williams offers for students um, because of its small size in a very um, intensive way. That's very exciting. And so continuing to think about how we can expand those opportunities for the talented folks we have here. And doing this all in the context of a strategic plan that's focused on two really core values that we're continuing to wind through everything we do. One is uh, based on diversity, equity, inclusion. How can we be a place that lifts up every member, uh, each of the talented members that we bring to this campus, um, remove barriers for their success, um, and allow them to go out and reach their highest ambitions? Um, and how do we do that in a fully sustainable uh, context in a world where um, challenges around uh, climate and, and uh, global warming continue to pose uh, challenges for all of us, but certainly for institutions of higher education, which are doing a lot of the research in this area, and then thinking about how we can um, move the needle for our students and our community uh, in living in a sustainable world. And so um, we, we, are, we are moving all of those conversations forward through strategic planning. And I thought, um, just to give you an example, um, and then I'll, I'll hand the mic over to um, Marlene, um, I, I wanted to talk about one of the strategic academic initiatives that has emerged out of the strategic planning process that I think shows the ways in which um, we are trying to think about the challenges of curriculum in the evolving world in which we're in right now. Um, and I could talk about several things, but I picked for today, I thought I would focus on um, an initiative in um, technology and the liberal arts, which is uh, asking for the campus and for, and for our 10 to 15 year horizon as we think about the future of Williams, how can we prepare students even better for the world they're going into, which is in essence being transformed as we speak um, with through the outreach of technology into all sectors. There was a time in liberal arts, and we still believe this right now, where every student had to leave being able to write. We believe that very deeply. We teach writing throughout the curriculum. We think that if you graduate without knowing how to write, um, you're, you're not going to be as, as able to reach your highest aspirations when you graduate. It is likewise becoming increasingly true that if you're not fluent in data analysis um, and an understanding of how to process and read and think through data and the way it intersects with the technological growth uh, in the world that our students will um, similarly uh, struggle um, with certain skills that um, will become it will be of central import as they uh, as they move into the next phases of their lives. So we're thinking about that on the on this campus, but we're thinking about it as I hope became clear when I made the comment about technology uh, and the liberal arts about what does it mean to think about technology in a in an educational environment where you're thinking about also about the humanities and the social sciences and the way we understand data usage. So ethics, um, philosophy. Uh, economics. So just to use an example, um, take artificial intelligence uh, and, or um, my own daughter has an interest in bioengineering. What are the ethics of that work? What are the social justice implications, the um, financial implications um, of the technological fields into which many of the students are going? And so one of the things I think a college like Williams is really positioned to do is to um, encourage students to think interdisciplinarily about, um, about some of these larger questions uh, that they will be facing as they go forward. Um, and so uh, these are some of the areas that we're seeking to make progress in. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about them, um, but I'm gonna pass the mic over to Marlene now, who will tell you a little bit more about the, the learning experience here for our students um, uh, as they progress through their, their first year and into their second. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Marlene Sandstrom. I'm the Dean of the College, and I'm a faculty member in the Psychology Department. I came here just over 20 years ago, so I've been at Williams for um, quite a while, in this role um, for four years now. Uh, and I thought I would take the opportunity to talk a little bit about what um, I see as on 
first year students' minds at this point in the semester and sort of where they are now and, and where they're headed. Um, so right now, what, where students are is in the thick of it, in their first semester of their first year in college. Uh, they are probably talking to you a little bit about what is um, happening in their classes. They have moved from the first couple weeks, which is all about the grand production of ideas, into the production of work. Um, and so there's papers and exams and deadlines, and I, I see some folks nodding, so I imagine that your sons and daughters have talked to you a little bit about that. I um, want to remind folks, I, I see some familiar faces from move-in day. Uh, I said this back then, and I'm going to say it again now. Um, that uh, if you hear your sons and daughters talking about feeling a little bit uncertain or worried or a little bit overwhelmed, worrying uh, if they belong here, uh, that they are not alone. Many, many students at this point in the first fall of their first year are feeling that way, not just at Williams, but at colleges and universities all across the country. It's kind of a developmental crisis of confidence that goes along with making the uh, transition uh, to college. It is a really great time uh, to remind students of the many, many folks here on campus who are really eager to sit down with them and talk with them, both to normalize that experience that everybody goes through of feeling a little bit overwhelmed and wondering if they're on track, and also helping them make sure that they are, in fact, on track. And primary among the folks who are really eager to talk to first-year students at this point in the semester are their faculty. Uh, Maud mentioned that the faculty here at Williams uh, are here at Williams because they really want to be at a place where undergraduates are at the center of everything. Williams is a phenomenal teaching institution, but the research and the scholarship expectations for faculty are extremely high. So, in fact, the faculty who come here uh, had a choice between coming to a place like Williams or to a big research institution. And the reason they came here is because of the joy that they find in working really closely and spending time with undergraduates. And now is the time when faculty are calling the deans in my office and saying that they really would like to figure out a way to sit down with some students in their classes who they notice seem a little uncertain or um, anxious. Um, they're reaching out in a variety of ways. They may be announcing to the class that they're really open and accessible to those conversations. They may be sending emails to students, inviting them to meet with them. It's a really great time um, for students to do that, um, to take the opportunity to sit down and talk to faculty members. The thing that's tricky about what might seem like a simple recommendation, you know, go, go talk to your faculty. They're really eager to sit down with you is that um, students who are just starting out at Williams are coming here with an incredible um, background of practically consistent success in every dimension possible. Um, and for them, feeling a little bit uncertain uh, is, can be new, and it can feel a little alarming to them. That's not something that many students are used to feeling. Um, and so what often happens is they, they feel a little alarmed, and then they feel a little disappointed in themselves for feeling a little bit alarmed. Uh, and they're worried about maybe letting themselves down. They're worried about letting other people down, including their faculty members. And so they tell themselves things like, yes, I really should go talk to my professor, but I want to wait until I get that late assignment in. Or I want to wait until I, let me just make sure I understand the material a little better, because when I meet with them, I want to put my, ba my best face on it. And, uh, of course, what happens is they end up avoiding doing the very thing that could really be the most helpful thing to them, which is just to sit down and uh, have a conversation with their faculty members about all the things that are going well and all the things that they're nervous about or uncertain about. So if you have the opportunity uh, to encourage your sons and daughters to sit down with faculty, even if that doesn't feel like the most natural thing to do, it's a great moment uh, for that to happen. The other, the other thing I'd like to mention at this point in the first semester is um, my thoughts about the first bump. Um, maybe your sons and daughters have already talked to you about uh, the first bump in the road. I say first because 
in college, like in life, there's going to be lots of bumps. Um, they take all kinds of shapes and sizes. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Um, uh, but right now, the big bump, the first bump, tends to be something like an exam that really didn't go well, or a paper that came back with lots and lots of constructive criticism in the, in the margins, or a deadline that the student couldn't meet. Um, and I think it's really important for students to know, and I'll express this to you too, in case you have some concern about it, that there really is, um, the bump is really not a good predictor at all at this point in students' career, six weeks in. It's not a good predictor of what they're good at or what they should and shouldn't pursue moving forward. There is nothing that I can imagine that could happen in the first six weeks on campus that should be telling a student that a certain line of inquiry, a certain discipline, a certain field is not for them. That first bump just isn't diagnostic in that way. It's a bump. It's not a roadblock. It's not a detour sign. It's not we're taking your driver's license away. It's just a bump. Um, and so I think it's really important for students to recognize that bad predictor. Bump doesn't predict anything specific about what they can or should or what they're meant to do. What the bump is good for is taking the opportunity to practice managing challenging situations, trying to figure out what resources are a good fit for what your student might need in that moment. We have so many resources on campus, a lot of interlocking supports, the writing workshop, the math science resource center, uh, peer tutors, the, well, the health and wellness center. Um, and the bump is really just a great opportunity to take stock of, OK, what are all the things that are out there and what might be a good fit for my needs right now? Um, our students know about our resources in a kind of vague and abstract way at this point in the semester. They've all been part of the First Days Orientation Program, which is this eight-day long tidal wave of information about everything Williams. And so they know in some sense about the resources, but it's really hard, and you may have had these experiences yourself in other contexts. Sometimes it's hard to know in the abstract when or why something might be helpful to you. So they know about the Health and Wellness Center and Integrative Wellness and the Peer Tutor Program, but until they're in a moment where those abstract resources might become useful to them, it's hard to put the puzzle pieces together. So now is a good opportunity to reconnect students with resources. We're trying to do that in the dean's office. It's a great opportunity for you if, you're, um, if your students are talking to you about some bumps, is asking them to think specifically about which of the many resources might be a good fit for them. And reminding them that at Williams, using those kinds of uh, resources is just an opportunity that strong students take to, to make themselves even, even stronger here. Um, the other thing that's on students' minds right now, believe it or not, is next semester, the spring semester. So they're just beginning, really, to settle into life on campus here. They're figuring out what their work habits are, where they like to study, and how they like to study, and getting a fuller sense of this place. And at the same time, next week, they're going to be sitting down with their faculty academic advisors to think about the set of courses that they want to pre-register for for the spring. That happens really quickly. So that is probably on their minds, or will be next week, the beginning to think about um, their course selection. Um, one thing that, uh, I mean, the, the idea of being able to select courses is to me one of the most exciting things about being a student because they are really at a liberal arts college where they have a lot of freedom. They are the architects of their academic journey and each time they make a choice, it's really exciting. They have this huge trunk of jewels that they can sift through and pick out um, what are the courses that, they, that make sense to them. At this point, it's a good moment to stop and take stock of what they've learned about themselves as a person and a student, even just in the six weeks they've been here. What have they learned about their academic experience that might shape the, the decision making um, that they're going to be doing next week? 
sometimes students worry, um, and family members might worry too, about whether or not they need to know what the big picture is or what they want to do at Williams. And uh, my answer to that is no. Um, that students shouldn't feel, some students feel kind of frozen about making their choices because they're not sure, like, well, where am I going with this? What is my major? Do I have a sense of the big picture? They don't need to know that as a second semester. Right now, they're a first semester, first year. They don't need to know that yet. Um, and that, in fact, the first year and well into the second year is the best possible time to be exploring the curriculum as broadly as possible. Some students do have a sense of what they want um, and are working toward a larger goal, and that's great. It's also great to not know yet um, and to be exploring the curriculum. Uh, what the faculty advisors will do when they meet with students next week is ask them sort of a set of questions to help them begin to think about uh, the choices they want to make. I thought I'd share a couple of the kinds of questions that they might be asking because they're great conversation starters for you um, if you want to be talking to your sons and daughters about, about their decision making. So one question is, what have you enjoyed the most? Um, what has been the most fun so far in the set of courses that you've taken? Is it the biology lab where you have hands-on experience and you're using observational skills and you're using high-tech equipment? Or is it a small group experience in a philosophy course? Or is it a new language that's opening up all kinds of new opportunities for you? What has been most enjoyable? Um, and sometimes a twist on that question is, what has surprised you in your classes? What have you found in your classes that you didn't expect? Um, because that's a way for students to figure out that sometimes there are things they enjoy in places, in disciplines, um, that they may not have thought to look. Um, and the other question is, what kinds of things are you interested in or curious about that might not necessarily play to the strengths you already know you have? If you know you enjoy something, that's great, and that is an indicator that you should take a little more of that. But what are the things that you're interested in, curious about, that may not play to the strengths that you know that you have? One of the remarkable things that happens here is that students take a risk, they take a class in a discipline that they never heard of, that they couldn't pursue in high school, and they realize not only that they enjoy it, but that they're good at it. Um, and they wouldn't have known that had they not um, taken the opportunity to move a little bit outside their comfort zone. Um, and the last question uh, that many faculty advisors ask and that I like to ask, both Maude and I are faculty advisors uh, for students, um, is what are the skills that you're hoping to work on? Is there something specific, a skill that you'd like to strengthen? Sometimes it's writing, as Maud mentioned. It might be quantitative skills or quantitative reasoning. Uh, one of the skills that I'm most passionate about is um, students finding their voice, uh, figuring out, learning how, uh, it, which is an iterative process, learning how to express themselves in ways that connect with other people. Uh, and that is not a designation in our course catalog. We do have courses that are designated as writing courses or quantitative skills courses. We have courses that are designated as difference, uh, power, and equity uh, courses. Um, we don't have a course called Finding Your Voice because it's so important that it's woven through almost all of the courses that we offer here at Williams, but because we have the luxury of this amazing uh, faculty-student ratio. We have so many small courses. And in smaller courses, students will, by necessity, begin to practice that skill of finding their voice. In a small class, the structure of that class is such that you can't be an observer. And there's no, you can't be in the back row because there is no back row. Everybody's in it. Um, and those classes are a really fantastic way for students with the help of the faculty member, but also the other students in the class, the peers, to learn that process of, of honing, finding, finding their voice, being able to express an opinion, a point of view, using evidence to back up a statement, and to do it in a way that uh, really connects and lands with other people. So if you have a chance to ask your your sons and daughters about the mix of classes they've taken so far. What are the size of the classes they've taken? Have they taken mostly big classes? Maybe they'd like to think about taking a smaller class. Some students are really excited and eager 
to be in the thick of it in those small classrooms with no back row. Uh, others might need a little, little more encouragement, um, but now is a good time to encourage students to, to sample um, a little bit uh, in terms of class size. I guess the last thing that I'll mention that I think is on students' mind at this point in the semester is not about academics, it's about relationships and the kinds of relationships that they've begun to develop on campus. Often at this point, early on in the first semester of college, students uh, are noticing that they haven't made a best friend yet. Uh, or they don't feel like they've found somebody here who reminds them of their closest friend or friends from home. Uh, and of course that makes a lot of sense because it's early days here and because the close friends that they have from home are often friends they've known for many, many years. Um, and of course the way that children make friends is different in a lot of ways from the ways that college students make friends. So children typically make friends through shared experiences and shared background. They grow up in the same neighborhood, they go to the same school, they, they're engaged in the same after school programs, they go to the same church or synagogue. So they share a lot of time and space and common experiences. And that's a really easy frame uh, for developing friendships. At college, students tend to make friends not based on shared background, but based on shared experience in the very new things that all students are trying out here on campus. We've got an incredibly diverse campus. Many of your sons and daughters are interacting with students whose backgrounds are incredibly different from theirs in almost every way possible. So the friendships that are developing are based on their shared experiences, the things they're trying out and doing, working on in class, uh, doing on the sports fields or in, in theater productions or working for the newspaper, all those other places. It's built on new experiences. And those kinds of friendships are less instant and less automatic than friendships that develop in early childhood and middle school. Uh, and they take a little bit more investment, but the skills that students get by developing those friendships and the friendships themselves are incredibly powerful and last well beyond Williams. So uh, what I tell students is you're, you're in very early days in terms of relationship building uh, and there's lots of time for those deep relationships to build and it's gonna be one of the most rewarding parts of being here on campus. Now we'd like to open up the floor for your questions. Um, and uh, we will be able to hear you very well. So if you just raise your hand and we pick on you to ask a question, then we'll repeat the question for the room so that everyone else can hear what the question was. The acoustics in here are good. But yes, I see there's already a question in the back. Could you tell us a little bit about the strategic planning process, how you're doing it? and who's involved? Oh yes, thanks, it's a great question. So the question was, uh, could I talk a little bit about the strategic planning process, how we've been doing it, and um, who's been involved? So, um, I started this actually almost immediately upon arriving last year. I called last year the plan for the plan year. So we spent um, a lot of the year, because I didn't know the community very well, sort of figuring out what how we should, to answer that question, how we should approach this, we set up a coordinating committee that then slowly figured out what the different working groups would be, um, on what we would work on and who would be in them and what the charges for those groups would be. And if you're interested, I'm always excited to let you know there's a very detailed web page that has all of the working groups and all of their charges. Uh, and you can find it just by Googling Williams College Strategic Plan. Uh, and what you'll see there is that we have eight working groups um, that focus on um, one, student learning, out of the classroom learning, faculty and staff development, governance, uh, sustainability, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, one we're calling Williams in the World, which is about um, sort of mostly actually about Williams' relationship to the Northern Berkshires and the way that we are a partner and collaborator with uh, folks in the region. Um, and I have left one out. Which one? Built environment. Thank you, the built environment. Right. So we're looking at all aspects of the college uh, through these. And um, 
it's in this year, the way we've done, so over the summer, those uh, committees came together, the charges had been written in the prior year, and over the summer, we spent some time doing research in both on campus, but also off campus, looking at other schools and programs to see uh, where some of the great work was going on. Uh, and now what we've been doing in the fall is a, a great deal of outreach to our own community. So in answer to your question, the working groups are rather small um, committees made up of faculty, students, and staff. Um, but they've all been charged with reaching out to the Williams community writ large. And um, I believe we've clocked 120 meetings of different outreach groups, um, some that are just open events. We had a planning day where anybody who wanted to come could come uh, during um, reading period when there were no classes. Uh, we have events at the log once a week where different working groups come and meet with anybody who wants to come to talk about the work of that group. Uh, but we also have targeted meetings of, say, um, I, I'm in charge of the governance group with the faculty governance committee or the staff committee. So, And we're really trying hard to, to make clear that we're interested in getting feedback and engagement from the whole community. So for example, the provost had meetings with second and third shift workforce uh, folks on the staff to make sure that they had an opportunity to participate since a lot of the outreach was taking place in times when they would not be able, excuse me, <coughs> able to do so. Um, and that's really, I think it's just important to say that we're doing this because and many of you work in higher ed, but a lot of you don't. Higher ed is its own beast when it comes to strategic planning. So if you come from the for-profit world, I think, and you think of a strategic plan, you think of something that somebody wrote in a couple of weeks. Um, it's usually pretty tight. It's for usually a fairly short period of time. Um, but a strategic plan on a, in a, on a university or um, a college is thinking often of the 10 to 15 year horizon and is very focused on tapping in to the incredible um, strength of a learning community. We have so many people here with so many ideas uh, who um, bring so much talent to the table uh, and we want to make sure that they are collaboratively engaged together in moving the institution forward. And so the collaborative process of bringing them in is, is, is both about figuring out what the plan will be, but also making sure that there's sort of consensus about that direction and that folks know what that direction is. Uh, and now the next phase will be writing the actual strategic plan, which will come out of this work, uh, and we will do that um, in the spring so that by June we can lay out publicly um, that work. But if you're interested in the various phases, the working groups will each have reports uh, up on, on the web in uh, late January, uh, and the draft of the strategic plan, and then the final uh, version will also be available to everybody, It'll, it's just online, but to alumni and parents who have also uh, shown significant interest in the future direction of the college. Thank you. Other questions? It can be about anything we talked about, but also things we didn't. Please, yes. Hi, um, I have uh, a sophomore uh, astrophysics major, and um, I'm curious, because I know you have a lot of not so much of in her field. Um, what would you suggest I tell her about uh, maybe this summer where she's gonna do research? Thank you, so I'll, maybe we can both take stabs at this. So the um, first, I, just to repeat the question, um, uh, the questioner mentioned that she has a sophomore who's interested in astrophysics work and that she went to the Career Center and that a lot of the sort of obvious opportunities seem more in business. Um, and so what, is the, what are the best pathways for directing a student to find productive internships and opportunities in their areas of interest if the first bite at the apple in the career center seems not to, to work? So let me say a couple of things about that, um, and, and I'm sure Marlene has thoughts to share too. Um, for starters, I would say the reason often at the uh, Career Center for Exploration that um, something one might call business or finance jumps out first and foremost is typically because those are industries that recruit heavily. So it's the easiest to find because they come to campus and they have the mechanism to do those, a structure to do it. They're, they they um, they are looking for students rather than the other way around, students looking for them, um, and they make it very easy. So this is often a critique. If you go to any school, you'll hear, well, you know, I'm not interested in that and my career office is only interested in that. But it actually doesn't so much reflect the interest of the career office as the industries themselves. Um, and it does mean that the work uh, for students interested in other areas um, is a little more on them because, say, not-for-profit, research, 
um, uh, don't have the same kind of infrastructure and resources to support going out to campuses the way students do. So we do have other mechanisms for supporting students to get to those uh, areas, but it, it does take more networking skill, and that's one of the things that the Career Center is trying to do. So one of the most valuable resources we have at Williams through the Career Center for Exploration is the alumni network. And in fact, uh, there is a web-based platform that students can engage with. It's not necessarily that they find an alum and get a job, right? It's not as quite as easy as that. Um, but we have a very powerful network that students can write to alumni for informational interviews, for advice, for connections, um, and that is, um, a, a, a has been and continues to be, I think, one of the most important resources we have for post-Williams students um, outside of the sort of obvious ones that uh, any college or university we, we would have. Williams graduates do very well, they're very well placed, and it may take a few of that, those kinds of outreach moments, but that is uh, a powerful network that I would suggest she tap into. Um, likewise, faculty can help with those kinds of outreach, it's, um, and sometimes they too, particularly in research areas and science, again, may not have an immediate, oh, here's a job for you, but they may have good suggestions in networking of who to reach out to, who then would give another suggestion of who to reach out to, and so on, until, um, until an opportunity comes together. Our, our students are very well positioned to find these opportunities, uh, but I think sometimes um, the, the hump to get over is that, um, and you all know this, that sometimes to find a job is itself a job, so it requires work. Um, and the Career Center is very helpful in resume preparation, interview skills, and teaching to network, but the students then have to do that effort of reaching beyond that first look and continuing forward. Do you want to say anything else? Sure. Um, <coughs> first of all, astrophysics, women are underrepresented in astrophysics, so fantastic, and I want to meet your daughter. Um, the, the, the platform that Maud's talking about at the, through the Career Center is called EFLINK, and what's really interesting about it is that you can search this huge database of Williams alums by all kinds of criteria. You can do it geographically, so if she knows she wants to wind up in a certain place, you can do it that way. You can do it by uh, kind of industry uh, uh, or discipline. Uh, you can search by diff different kinds of identity or affinity groups. There's all kinds of ways to search. It's a really powerful um, platform, so I highly recommend that. And also, reiterating Maud's idea of finding a faculty member within astrophysics to talk to them about who they know, um, who are doing interesting things, who have, often there's a pipeline of uh, labs um, and programs at other institutions that have a history of taking Williams students, and faculty members would know about that. The other place to go is the fellowship office. Um, the fellowship office funds all kinds of really interesting summer opportunities. Uh, so that would be the third uh, recommendation. Thank you. I believe there was a question over here, yes. yes. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, the pass-fail option, um, which is obviously a, a wonderful thing for students to try different courses. Um, I have a particular uh, criticism that I'm hoping you could address, in that when you choose a class to take pass-fail, it does not count towards a distribution requirement, which seems to me to greatly weaken the whole purpose of the pass-fail program. Given that you're able to take up to three courses pass fail, um, why not consider possibly saying one of them um, could count towards distribution, but not all three or two of them? Or, or I know you already have a restriction against um, taking too many in a uh, subject that the student majors in, but to have it not count at all um, to me discourages all sorts of experimentation. Thank you. So the question is about our pass-fail system and the limitations students face on directing one of the three courses they can take pass-fail to their uh, distribution requirements, which um, you've suggested uh, might diminish its power as uh, an exploratory tool for across the curriculum. I'm going to let Marlene talk about this because she is, uh, oversees the curriculum as dean of the college. Um, so why don't you do that and then I might say something else. Sure. Um, so I think originally the intent of that, of the restriction on pass-fail not to be used in distributional requirements was an effort to make sure that when students did take courses in those distributional areas, which are meant to represent breadth, that they would do that uh, with great vigor uh -huh, and, um, and put a lot of effort into it. 
Your suggestion is one that has come up uh, in the Committee for Educational Affairs. I sit on that committee. It's a faculty student committee. And in fact, we're very interested in thinking about what we mean by exploration, what we mean by breath, and whether it would make sense for students to be able to use a pass-fail for at least one course in each distribution. The argument being that sometimes what students do is they try to find the easiest course within a distribution rather than what they're really interested in because they're worried about the grade. They can't, they can't, they can't take pass-fail, so they're driven by what will get them a grade that they feel okay about rather than what they're interested in. So we're on this. It's something that we're actively thinking about and pursuing. Uh, the way that changes in academic policy work is, is, uh, is incremental, so it goes through a couple of committees and then is brought to the faculty uh, for a vote, but your very proposal is something that, that folks have taken up this year. And I, I would just note my own view on this is quite aligned with yours. Uh, this is one of those areas where a, a single person, because of the way academia works, doesn't make these decisions, but I actually, I do believe that, that um, opening up um, pass fail is a very powerful exploratory tool um, and one that I would personally like to see very much uh, uh, expand in terms of the opportunities here. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, I have a question about double major. So there are certain classes which can be counted uh, for one major, you know, major A and B but that class cannot be double count for the both major. I'm thinking is for a student who double major on certain thing, you would like the student also learn some other classes, but because that class cannot be double counted towards those two major, you know, the student would have to take more classes. I wonder what's the rationale that uh, you know, a class cannot be double counted. Uh, so just to repeat the question, is uh, a question about why courses uh, in two majors, if a student is double majoring, can't be counted to both majors. If they take one course and it is relevant to both, why uh, we can't count it to both? And there is a, you, that, there's a history to that, too, if you want to talk it, about it, it. The rationale predates me. <laughs> um, but again, I think the, uh, the, the, the purpose of that was to make sure that when students that students who are choosing to double major were doing that because they were really invested in both of those topics and not double majoring as a way to add on a credential. In other words, so that you would really demonstrate interest in both areas by not letting courses overlap and count toward both majors. This too uh, is on the agenda for the Committee on Educational Affairs. It's almost as though folks in the audience have been listening to our, <laughs> our committee meetings um, because uh, from a theoretical perspective, it's hard to understand why, if a course could count, a double listed course could count toward both, why it shouldn't, and wouldn't that then free students up to have more elective courses to explore the curriculum. So this, too, is something that we're thinking about. It leads to the larger question about double majors. I know you have thoughts about this. Do you want to talk Yeah, a sure. Bit? And, I, and I would just say that, actually, I mean, there's, in some ways, no question you can ask us where we won't say we're thinking about that right now because strate strategic planning does allow you to question all inherited assumptions. Um, this committee exists outside of strategic planning, but I, I think we're all right now as a part of that sort of um, energy to, to question everything. We're, we're, um, we may end up reifying some of our commitments, but we'll do it because we really thought about it rather than just because we've always done it. Um, I would say that Williams students have a staggeringly um, a huge interest in double majoring, sometimes even triple majoring. I often hear students saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm majoring in you know, physics and philosophy and I'm concentrating in leadership studies. And um, it's, it's a little mind boggling, actually. Um, it's not my favorite feature uh, of our student um, educational opportunities because actually uh, the double major, to your point, actually, the more you major, the, the less breadth you have, right? So if you're trying to balance breadth and depth, um, our students who are double and triple majoring um, are, are picking depth over breadth uh, rather than some kind of balance. And I, I fear that sometimes they do it for the wrong motives. 
I think the right motive to double major is that you have a deeper interest in two specific areas, hopefully things that you couldn't double count because they're so different from each other in art history and, 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 and physics, right? Or, and then the question of the double counting wouldn't matter because you have such incredible, incredibly diverse interests that you're taking a little bit of depth in things that cross over the breadth of human knowledge that, uh, and, and your passion and enthusiasm and curiosity and interest in those topics gets you to want to go one step further. I fear that sometimes our students double major because they think they're, they're seeking the credential. They think that somehow by doing two things that are sort of similar to each other, they'll look all the more specialized in that thing and it will help them later. Um, I tell them all the time that what you major in in college, nobody cares about. Nobody cares about, how many of you employ people for a living? How many of you study what they majored in in college as a major credential? I see one hand. Okay, so, and again, it's not nobody, right? It's not no field. Certainly, if you want a doctorate in history, which is what I have, it, it probably helps to major in history. Not, actually, I didn't, by the way. But, but, so it's not even a given. It was a long time ago. But <laughs> it's not even a given. But it helps in certain fields. Or if you're going to be pre-med and you don't do the pre-med uh, uh, courses that you have to do, that's not really about majoring, but you, you obviously there are, there are fields you go into where you need certain kinds of coursework. But mostly a major, that's not what a major is. Mostly what a major is, is an, a, and some of you heard me say this in first days when I spoke to the parents about this, it is an introduction to what it takes to become an expert in something. You don't become an expert in that thing, right? Ten courses is never going to allow you to be an expert. But it is an introduction to what it would take to become an expert in something. It is depth in that sense. It's not real depth, because ten courses does not depth make. But it is an introduction to what it would take if you wanted to be an expert. They will go on to become experts in something. You are experts in whatever it is you do. But, uh, but they won't become experts in that thing here. And in fact, the thing they study here is very likely not the thing they're going to go on to become an expert in. But they will begin to understand what it would take to write one footnote in one biology paper if you wanted to make the case uh, for how cells grow or uh, pick, the, pick the field of interest. Um, that's what a major is. You can learn that by doing it in one major. You don't actually have to do that in two, uh, and, but you should if you're really excited about two very different things. So I think that, that and I, I think those of us in, I think if you surveyed most faculty, I almost want to say all faculty, I'm not sure, but we would all say the same thing about double majoring. The only thing that, that double majoring does for us that's good is when a student double majors in both a humanities and a science, say, it ensures that they are spreading across the curriculum, so faculty like that, right? So if you're an English major, you're, you're an English professor, you're happy that students are picking English, and if you're a, a sociologist, you're happy they're picking sociology. So, so uh, faculty might not like to discourage double majors for that reason, but, but in terms of an intellectual commitment to what we're trying to do in college, it's unnecessary, and it is actually meaningless for students. So. So that's a long-winded answer that you, to a question you didn't ask. But, but, but I think it's a very important message for parents to take back to students, because I can tell you they don't listen to us when we tell them that. They don't believe us when we say a major doesn't matter. But you just were the proof, right? You can tell them how many employers here think the major was important, um, first of all. But it's a very hard message to get across. I have a, a sophomore in college, my own son, who doesn't even believe me. So, so I know how hard it is to get that message across. But, but most <laughs> students, they take uh, two majors. They do, and that's, there's, yeah, sometimes they're divergent. The purpose of education, they gain perspective from, you know, like a humanities. And, and then it's great, because uh, it has that. Yeah, and one of the great things about being in a college rather than a university is, in fact, you can major in two things and still have a lot of room left over. In a university, that would be harder, because if you're getting a Bachelor of Sciences, it's often 20 22 credits, 20 credits, and you don't have many left for a second major. But if it's only nine or 10 credits to a major, and you do two of them, you still have 12 left to do other things. So it's, you know, it has um, some options if you're gonna do that breadth, yeah. I believe we're at the be about 50% of students choose to major in more than one thing, and about 50% focus on one major. Other questions, yes, please. Yes. Uh, it's a little hard to formulate. Before I ask my question, I just want to say, 
the beginning of the year has been spectacular for my That's job. Great. And um, the entry system has been fantastic in terms of making friendships. And academically, it's been a great and extracurricular, so good job. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Maude, you, you brought up a lot of things that have been on my mind. Uh, specifically, you know, the strategic planning and some of the different areas that you're looking at, um, and ethics being one of them. Uh, so this is where it's, I'm trying to think about how to form this. So I went to the lecture yesterday, uh, that extraordinarily brilliant man who uh, talked about his work and interest in mineral extraction and how and he was fabulous. And, and one of the things that I spoke to a student afterwards about, one of the things we were marveling at is his interdisciplinary approach to thinking about this very crucial issue. And it, of course, deals with climate issues very you know, seriously. Um, but one thing that I felt he didn't address well enough, and I actually had an opportunity to speak to him briefly after the talk, was that in talking about mining and extracting important uh, minerals for sustaining our uh, world economy, he didn't talk enough about the uh, ethical element of what mining can do to communities. And, and <coughs> believe me, he's thought about it, and he's a you know, he's really thought about it, but he didn't talk about it. And um, that troubled me, in a way, because we live in a time where I think we're all acutely aware of how uncertain the world is, and both uh, climate issues and income inequality, and who's got the power and who doesn't. And the importance of ethics, and you know, the person who asked the question about going to the career center and the business people, and so it's me. It's important, but if that's sort of the leading edge of what students kind of can get to most easily, then we have to really think about uh, what it is that um, students can get to when they're nervous. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not going to repeat the whole question, but I will just focal, uh, focus on the point about how does a liberal arts education help students understand how to be ethical in the world uh, as they continue to pursue their educational and professional goals. Um, and actually, I would completely agree with the assumption baked into your comment and question, which is that it is the job of college uh, to help students think about those things. And I feel, in fact, in, intensely privileged myself to work in uh, a sector of the world where uh, we think about these things all the time and we are constantly thinking about how to um, interact with students around them. It is true that not every class does it, right? It's You're going to hope that the 32, the whole experience uh, uh, leads to it. Um, but I think the good news um, certainly it's reflected in the commitments of our strategic plan, which are reflected back from things I heard on this community, the things people care about and want to talk about it. But the good news is I barely get through a day here where somebody isn't bringing up some version of one of the two things you just brought up, essentially, which was the, underneath the ethics, which was kind of what's happening to our world in terms of um, climate and global warming change, uh, changes on the one hand, and secondarily, inequality. And, um, and our students are going to go out into a world where both of those things are things they have to grapple with. It's, you know, uh, and, and even how they interpret and understand those things, what we mean by inequality now versus what we used to mean and how it's changed and hasn't over time. So, um, so I, to me, uh, I think it's, I couldn't agree more that um, our curriculum needs to help students think about how to approach those challenges that they are going to continue to face here and when they graduate, but I'm also tremendously optimistic that we do, um, while simultaneously saying that all, you, you ended with your comment about careers, that, that students, just because they choose to go a particular pathway professionally doesn't mean that they haven't had that thoughtful uh, ex, uh, experience and that they aren't themselves going out to think about how they, in their workplaces and the work they're doing, uh, can bring the ki some of the kinds of changes we're talking about. I do, I do see that all the time, and I see it in our alumni, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm really um, optimistic that higher education is the only way, actually, that we can really deeply wind this into our society going forward, even if it's flawed and the work is never done. Oh, thank you. I, I would just 
Okay. Yeah, I was just going to add, I really appreciate that question. Um, I mentioned briefly that one of our um, requirements, and we really don't have many, uh, we're on the relatively low end in terms of requirements, but one of the requirements by the time students graduate is to take a course that fits into this um, category of uh, difference, power, and equity. And there's a range of really fascinating courses in all three divisions across all disciplines about systemic, systemic structures um, and the effect that they have on people's lives um, that gets at some of what you're talking about, really embedded throughout the curriculum. And the other thing that I find invigorating is to take a look at the several hundred student organizations um, that are uh, on this campus and are really active on this campus. It gives me hope when I see what students are interested in and the kinds of groups and organizations that they're creating around some of the very issues that you're talking about. So I think we have time for one more question, if there's one out there. Yes, please. My son is a freshman. He hasn't decided his major yet, more likely in the liberal arts field. And then he jumped right into a tutorial course, which seemed to be having very uh, uh, tough workload. And so I wasn't sure, like, at this point, what she should do with the summer intern, because he doesn't seem like he has any time to explore anything. Uh, do you have any advice? So the question is, uh, actually, I'm going to even extract out of it, which is to say, your son is working very hard, hasn't made a decision yet about what he wants to do, even here, much less for the summer, and there's just not enough time, basically, to, to pursue all of these opportunities. Um, I think, uh, Marlene, maybe you should take the first stab at this one, and then I'll follow. Well, the first thing I'll say <laughs> is that one thing um, that is true is that it is OK for students in their first summer especially, but not restricted to, to not be doing something pre-professional or highly academic over the summer. It really is okay. Really, to, really, it's okay. To work in a restaurant or to, you know, work at, anywhere um, that maybe a continuation of a job that they really enjoyed in high school, that that is fine. Um, and it is also really okay, um, and I think helpful in some ways for, um, students not to know at this point what exactly it is that they want to major in or what they want to pursue. Fabulous that he took a tutorial. We have a lot of tutorials that are meant for first year students that don't have prerequisites for the very purpose of getting students excited about an area um, in a really intimate setting with one peer and, and a faculty member. So the, the summer is wide open. There's, there's not a choice he could make that would be a bad choice for the summer. He could choose to do something that is not academic at all. Uh, he, could he could use LinkedIn to see if there's, I'm um, not sorry, not LinkedIn, EFLINK, uh, to see if there's something interesting um, that is up his alley in the geographical area that he would like to be. Uh, he could go to the fellowship office. There's all kinds of interesting fe travel fellowship opportunities um, for students, but the pressure should be low uh, because there's not a bad choice. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm going to echo this just by really, in fact, you can be helpful with your sons and daughters to take a little bit of the pressure, particularly off the first summer. It builds up very intensely, particularly if there's a lot of peer pressure. The ones that go into those preset pathways are often very quickly there and have their summers wrapped up. Um, we, the name of our career office here is the Career Exploration Center, and that's because we really do believe that um, students shouldn't be pursuing a professional path at this stage of their lives. They should be exploring what's out there much the way they explore a philosophy class or an anthropology class or a chemistry class, but they don't know yet what they're good at or what they want to do. The same is true, if not more so, about the professional world. If you think about the jewel, the box of jewels that you called the course guide, that's, uh, there's so many professions out there these students don't know what they want to do, what they're good at, and they don't need to know yet, and it's fine. I, I often say that people, the m most important thing people learn from their first job is that they absolutely do not want to do whatever it was they did at their first job. Um, and it's okay not to have that happen until their sophomore summer. It's just, it's okay. And in fact, it's very good sometimes for first year students to come home the first summer, see their high school friends, be home with their families, uh, have that experience of, of reconnecting. Um, if, if only as part of the bridge to not doing that another summer, but it, it, it does, uh, it can provide for some students a very reassuring return to something that is constant in a life that has been changing. So if I had you know, sort of advice for parents, it would be to take the pressure down. Here's something, I, I should probably stop saying this publicly because probably someday it won't be true anymore, but I've got to say, 
in the economy these students are going into with a Williams degree, they are going to be fine. They're gonna get jobs, they're gonna to go to graduate school, like everything is gonna be fine. Um, and, and I know how much nervousness goes into figuring out what that pathway is and will it be the right one and will they be happy and will they be good at it and will they make enough money and will they you know, have it all figured out? And they're really tense about that. Uh, parents are really tense about that. I have, I have been tense about those things myself so I understand it, but I give myself a little lecture because I empirically know that the evidence is right now, it's not always true, but right now the evidence is that the economy is one that well-educated students with a Williams degree go out into the world and do good things. And so they can take their time right now to figure out which direction to go and figure out what they're good at. Um, and with your support, uh, they'll, they'll do that in, a, in maybe a less agitated state of mind than is often true. So, so um, I think we're out of time, but I wanted to thank everybody for coming out. It's really great to, to see all of you here, and we look forward to uh, hearing about your experiences. <laughs>